Good afternoon and welcome. This webinar is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, VA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, CFBMP, and the VA Mental Illness Research Education Clinical Center, MIRAC, at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center. My name is Trulasta Pauling. I am the Senior Outreach Specialist in CFBMP. I will be your moderator this afternoon. Everyone's phone has been muted. If you have a question during the presentation today, please type it in the Q&A box on the right of your screen. I will read the questions at the end of the presentation and the presenter will provide a response. The presentation will be sent to everyone that registered and joined this webinar today. This is a live recording. I would like to thank our presenter for today, Ms. Georgia Gerard. We are grateful for your time today. At this time, I would like to introduce you to her. Please read her entire bio on the screen. Ms. Gerard is a licensed clinical social worker with the Mental Illness Research Education Clinical Center. Her background is in the assessment of suicide risk in veterans and suicide risk management best practices. She serves as a consultant on the VA Suicide Risk, Risk Management Consultation Program and provides implementation and technical assistance support for VA National Suicide Prevention Program. At this time, I give you today's presenter, Ms. Georgia Gerard, for, for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pauling, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Um, so I also just want to let you know my colleague, Sarah Peterkin, is also on. Um, so if there's questions in the chat. She can maybe help me answer those um, later as well. Um, so if questions are coming up um, as, I'm, as I'm talking, please put them in the Q&A. We definitely have time at the end to address those. Um, but today we are going to be talking about the VA SAVE. Um, might be an acronym you're, you're familiar with, um, or maybe not, maybe it's new. Um, but we're going to be talking about the steps of SAVE and also talking a little bit about postvention, suicide postvention. So what might happen, what are resources available if there is a loss to suicide? So just a little bit of an overview about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we will just a little bit about facts about suicide, um, some recent data that we have around suicide risk in the U.S. population and then in our veteran population, uh, discuss common myths versus realities around suicide, going through the steps of phase, and then talking about suicide postvention, the impact of suicide laws, and then at the end, there's a few slides of resources that are available on to everyone. So before we get started, um, you know, I hope um, the presentation today answers some of these questions or concerns that you all might have. Um, but I just want you to take a minute um, just to think about what questions do you have around suicide, um, questions that you have about talking to people in crisis, talking to family, loved ones, your community members. Um, what questions do you have or, or um, concerns? And hopefully we will address that today. Um, but if anything remains unanswered or you have further questions, um, hopefully we, we will be able to address that at the end of the presentation. All right, so suicide in the United States and the veteran population. Um, this just shows a graph of kind of over time since 2001 to 2020, um, what the, the rates of suicide have been um, in our veterans and non-veteran adult population. So this is goes up to 2020. Um, our death data is delayed. So every year a new suicide data report comes out, usually in September, October. Um, so hopefully that will be coming out here soon. Um, but the data is delayed two years. So this is from our last year's report in 2022, which reports data up through 2020. Um, suicide was the 12th leading cause of death in the US. Over 45,000 adults died by suicide, and that included 6,146 veterans. Um, so what we do know about suicide, um, it is a uh, younger field of research and, and what we do know about it, but um, it's often a result of a complex interaction of risk and protective factors that happen at, on an individual level, 
what's happening in someone's community, and also what might be happening in society. Um, so it's not just one thing that leads a person to making the decision to um, take their own life. It is a interaction of these things, um, and we might not always know or fully understand what, what the interaction was and what was leading someone to make that decision. Um, you know, risk factors that contribute to um, someone's risk for suicide are, are characteristics that, um, you know, are associated with increased likelihood of suicidal behaviors. And those protective factors um, can often help offset those risk factors. So in the next few slides, we'll be talking a little bit about what are risk factors, what, are, what do we know are common risk factors for suicide, and what do we know about protective factors. Um, so to prevent suicide or work towards preventing suicide, the goal is to maximize protective factors, so increasing you know, protective factors, reasons for living, while trying to decrease or minimize um, any risk factors that someone has through all levels. So working on the person individually, um, how they're integrating throughout their community and in society. Um, so this is not an extensive list by any means of what these risk factors for suicide are. Um, if you have other ideas, you, know, you can feel free to share those in the Q&A as well. Um, but we think about, you know, someone's health. What mental health conditions do they have? Um, do they have depression, PTSD, maybe um, a combination of mental health conditions are going on? And how is their physical health? Um, you know, risk factors, if, you know, if you have um, a progressive disease, do you have a diagnosis, a new diagnosis of something like cancer? Um, what is going on with someone in their physical health that might be a risk factor for suicide? Uh, chronic pain and traumatic brain injury are also known, known risk factors for um, suicide as well. Um, in someone's environment, um, do they have access to lethal means, um, easy access to lethal means? Are they experiencing prolonged stress in their environment? Uh, maybe stressful life events, loss of a job, loss of a relationship. Um, death in the family. And we also know that exposure to suicide by others um, also puts individuals at risk for suicide. And that exposure could be um, losing someone close to them, a loved one, and it could also just be knowing someone who died by suicide, an acquaintance, maybe a former um, military member, um, someone in their community. So we do know exposure to suicide um, is also puts someone at risk for suicide themselves. And we also like to look at people's history. Do they have a history of previous suicide attempts? Um, do they have a family history of, of um, you know, mental health concerns or suicide attempts? Have they been exposed to childhood abuse, neglect, or trauma? Um, so these are all, you know, you know, overall risk factors that we know from research and in the literature of what might put someone at increased risk for suicide. And on the other hand, um, there's also protective factors. Um, so is um, this person engaging in you know, healthy behaviors? Do they have good physical health? Um, are they, um, if they have mental health concerns, are they accessing treatment? Are they you know, accessing medications or alternative forms of, of, mental health, or of treatment? Um, are they engaging in healthy behaviors like exercise, their diet, you know, things like that? Um, access to care is a, is a big one. Um, you know, you might have access to care, but how easy is it, easily accessible is it? Are you living in a rural, rural place and, you know, accessing care is a little bit more difficult? Technology um, and medical compliance. Um, so you might have ongoing health concerns. Are you um, adherent to, um, you know, taking medications as you need to or managing um, health concerns? Um, environmental, you know, family and community support, uh, restricted or, or limited access to lethal means, um, living in a safe and stable in environment. Um, personal um, protective factors that someone might have that sense of purpose, feel like they have meaning meaning in life, um, you know, uh, cultural, spiritual, religious beliefs, um, self-esteem and hope for their future, future-oriented, have, have goals they're working towards, and um, coping skills. So when something stressful comes up in life, maybe something unexpected, um, they feel like they have the coping skills to um, get through that crisis or that, that problem that they're experiencing without resorting to maybe suicidal thoughts or suicidal behavior. 
Um, so we did want to talk a little bit about lethal means. As we know, um, lethal means, uh, access lethal means and doing lethal means um, safety is one of a, an intervention that we are able to do. Um, so research has shown that the time from decision to attempt suicide to acting on that decision is less than one hour. Um, and we also know that fatal um, firearm injuries are um, 85 to 90% fatal as com compared to other methods combined, which are only 5% fatal. Um, so we talk about access to lethal means um, as a way to build in time and space. So with that hour that this individual might have, um, maybe they're doing something different if they don't have easily access to those means. Maybe they're reaching out for help. Uh, maybe they are calling the crisis line. Maybe they are doing something to distract themselves without that readily accessible means um, to kill themselves. And we also know that people rarely, um, you know, substitute one means for another. So um, if you reduce um, access to uh, medications, that person will rarely seek out another means with um, the intent to, to attempt suicide. Um, and it is one of the few population level interventions that we have that has shown decrease in suicide rates. Um, and it's something that people can engage in discussions with their community members, their family members. This is an intervention that, um, you know, mental health professionals do, you know, talking about mean safety and counseling on that, but it's also something that loved ones, community members, everyone should have these discussions around access to lethal means. Um, and, you know, about 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not go on to die by suicide. So with all of that, um, we are here today um, because we can all prevent suicide. It does not have to be inevitable for anyone. Hoping that by having this conversation, having the information available to support someone who might be ex expressing suicidal thoughts, um, directing them to the help for those who might need it, um, we can all work together to prevent suicide and hopefully save lives. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, sometimes concern about, you know, talking about suicide might lead to increasing someone's suicide risk, which we know isn't, isn't true. And um, evidence shows that providing those services, talking about suicide, and reducing access to lethal means um, are actions that we all, we all can take. Um, and then you know, understanding the issues, um, you know, what the risk factors for suicide, what, you know, issues around mental health. Um, is a, an important part we all can take in suicide prevention and really changing the conver conversation around suicide. There's still, you know, so much stigma attached to mental health and suicide. So by having these open discussions, getting more information, um, really just helps move the, the conversation around suicide in a different way. So next, you guys, we'll just talk a little bit um, about myths versus realities regarding suicide. And um, I think we all come into these conversations with some preconceived thoughts around mental health or suicide, um, you know, based on our upbringings, our cultural backgrounds, you know, we all have our, you know, our, our own thoughts around suicide and, and mental health. And um, there might be things that you have thought about suicide before that Maybe you learned a little bit more and don't think about it that way anymore. Or maybe, um, you know, there's things that you've heard around suicide um, that kind of continue the stigma around it that has been part of our kind of cultural narrative around suicide. Um, so these are just, you know, again, not extensive, uh, an extensive list, but just some really common ones that, that we talk about are, um, you know, people who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. Um, you know, they're talking about suicide um, as a way to, you know, um, get someone to react to them, get something that they're wanting, um, you know, just trying to get attention from those around them, which we know is, um, you know, not always true. You know, you know, no matter how casually or joking, um, anyone who discusses suicide, makes a suicidal statement, it should never be ignored. Um, it could indicate that there are more serious suicidal feelings. Um, so when someone is bringing up, you know, talking about suicide, even if it's you know, casual, like, oh, you know, you'll miss me when I'm gone, or oh, I just want to kill myself, this is so hard. Um, you know, anyone who kind of talks about suicide provides you an opportunity to intervene, um, kind of asking them, you know, what's going on? 
you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, so it really provides that kind of opening to have a, a, a bigger discussion with someone when they're making statements. Um, another myth that we, we commonly um, hear and, um, you know, this is why we do these um, trainings and talk about SAVE is, you know, the only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. And, and we know that that's not all, that is also not true. Um, you know, whoever the person who's expressing suicidal thoughts is, it feels comfortable enough to do that to, you know, you play an important role of supporting that person. And then, you know, also if they are needing more support special support directing them to those resources as well. But you don't have to be a mental health counselor or therapist to effectively intervene with someone who um, might be in crisis. And, you know, really that person feeling, um, you know, included, showing genuine interest in what they're going through, that support can really make a huge difference during a challenging time. Um, and you don't have to have the, the mental health background to, to show help for help, heartfelt support, or, you know, genuine uh, response to someone who's, who's in crisis. Um, so before I go on to the steps of SAVE, are there, you know, any other, in, you know, you can, I'll wait a second if you want to put any in the Q&A. Are there any other myths or common beliefs that um, you may have experienced or have heard about around, around suicide? All right, well, I will, um, I will keep an eye out on the Q&A if anything does come in. You can certainly go back to that. So I want to make sure I'm, I'm staying on track with, with um, the content today and make sure we can get through it all so there's enough time for, at the end for questions. Um, so the next slide will be going through the steps of SAVE. Um, this might be something that you've um, taken a training of before, maybe you've heard of before, maybe it is brand new um, information. Um, but SAVE is, you know, really the steps to help a person, you know, at risk for suicide, acting with that care and compassion that, that we were just talking about if someone is in a crisis or maybe they're not at a, in a current crisis, but they're talking about suicide, they're talking about feeling distressed or other risk factors and warning signs that, that you might hear um, in regards to suicide. So, um, S is the signs of suicidal thinking that should be recognized and things to be looking out for. Um, asking the most important question of all, validating that individual's experience, and then encouraging treatment and expediting getting help. So, um, you know, how, how you all can play a role in this safe communities and suicide prevention. Um, you know, for many, um, going to a mental health professional is not their first stop when they're in crisis or maybe experiencing risk factors or, you know, um, any, anything else might be contributing to um, being in distress or in crisis. Sometimes um, a um, faith leader or a person in the faith community might be the first person that someone seeks out. Um, that might be before friends, before family, especially before mental health providers or crisis services. So you, you're, you and your communities might be, um, you know, one of the first um, to intervene if someone is seeking out crisis services. Um, and, you know, faith communities can provide this, you know, sense of connectedness and supportive environment for the individual in crisis, which is sometimes um, what, what an individual is needing. Maybe they're feeling that lack of connection or um, maybe not feeling a sense of purpose um, at that time. Um, so, you know, individuals who are faith-based or do have spiritual beliefs and practices um, sometimes give individuals greater meaning in their lives and can increase their hope for their future. Um, so you all in, in these faith-based and community, um, you know, have such an important role to play because it might be, um, you know, this, this is where people feel comfortable and welcomed to share that they're, they're in crisis. All right. So, <laughs> excuse me, uh, the signs of suicidal thinking. Um, these are different than in the earlier slides when I talked about risk factors. So risk factors are what we know 
based on research and, and, and trying to learn a little bit more about suicide that might put someone at increased risk. These warning signs are really person specific. Um, you know, hopelessness um, or, you know, things like anxiety might be something people experience, but doesn't always lead to thinking about suicide. And others, that might be a personal warning sign for them that, you know, they're heading towards the crisis or they're experiencing suicidal thoughts. So it's very individualized, very person specific. But if present, um, you know, it might indicate that that person needs um, some more support, more help or further assessment to really understand what, what they're experiencing. Um, so these, these warning signs are, you know, very common, um, but you know, how people experience them would be very individualized if, if it feels like it's a warning sign to a suicidal crisis. But hopelessness is, is a big one. Feeling like there's, there's no way out. Um, this might be feeling like this is the only way to solve the problem that they're experiencing. Um, maybe uh, the person's experiencing anxiety, agitation, um, difficulty sleeping, changes in their mood, um, rage or anger, feeling like there's no reason to live, um, engaging in risky activities, which could also include, you know, increasing alcohol or drug use, and that social isolation or withdrawing from friends and family. Um, so again, not, not, uh, not every warning sign out there, but these are a lot of common ones that we hear about and that people experience. Um, if you have other ideas, I also welcome you to put those in the Q&A as well. Um, but these are definitely things that um, be paying attention to. If, if you're noticing changes in someone's mood, you could, you know, ask what's going on. Or if, um, you know, they're making statements about feeling hopeless about their future. Um, if you're noticing things like withdrawing or isolation, um, all, all important warning signs to be paying attention to. Um, so, again, those are, you know, um, maybe more ob observations that you might notice in someone or someone might disclose, like, hey, I'm not sleeping well or I'm just feeling, like, really, you know, uh, lonely or I'm not, I'm not feeling very hopeful about my future. Um, those are more, you know, the person you might be observing it or they might be talking a little bit more about those warning signs. These are um, more direct um, and really require more immediate attention, um, you know, if the individual is thinking about hurting or killing themselves, maybe researching for ways to die, um, talking about death, dying, or suicide, um, and then that, that self-destructive or risk-taking behavior, especially in health, alcohol, drugs, or weapons. Um, so those are um, a little bit more um, direct um, that you know that someone may be experiencing suicidal crisis. Other warning signs might not be as easy always to pick up on someone that they might be experiencing. All right, and then asking the question is, is A, and it's, you know, knowing how to ask that most important question of all. I know, you know, asking someone if they're thinking about suicide can feel super uncomfortable. What if they say yes? What do I, what am I going to do? This is someone I care about. Like, I don't want that person to be feeling that way. Um, so it can feel very uncomfortable sometimes um, or scary maybe even to ask someone if, if they're thinking about suicide. But being very direct about it. Um, asking the question, are you thinking about suicide? Have you had or are you having thoughts about taking your own life? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Um, being very direct about what you're asking. Um, and this might be, um, you know, if you've noticed. So asking it, asking those direct questions if you've identified warning signs in someone, um, you know, as natural of a way that you can that flows with the conversation. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you just have to ask. Um, but, you know, if someone is disclosing, you know, hey, um, you know, I haven't really been sleeping well. My appetite's kind of gone. I'm feeling a little lonely. Um, you know, naturally in the conversation, you might ask, like, hey, are you, are you having thoughts of killing yourself? Um, you know, really asking the question as best you can in a way that flows with the conversation. But not asking it in a way that looks like you're looking for a no answer. And I feel like this is such human nature, especially when we're maybe feeling uncomfortable or hoping for a no answer. I think we instinctively ask the question in a way that makes it easier for the person to respond no. Like, you aren't thinking of killing yourself, are you? Naturally, the person might just say, no, I'm not. Um, it looks like you're maybe looking for that no answer. So being that, that more direct, are you having thoughts of killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Um, you know, kind of goes with 
making it as natural as you can with the conversation. Hope, hopefully it doesn't, you know, have to be at the end of the conversation. Someone's halfway out the door trying to leave, leaving enough room where you feel like you can really hear the person, hear what they're going through, and, and providing that support so it doesn't feel rushed or um, like you're, you're, you don't have time to sit down with that person. Um, so just some considerations um, to be thinking about. Um, you know, there's a lot of differences about how individuals talk about death or dying. Some people feel, you know, very comfortable talking about it. Um, and others, um, you know, it's very stigmatized. They don't feel comfortable about it. They might feel, um, you know, judged about having thoughts about suicide or, um, you know, so there's definitely some differences about how individuals talk about it and also their comfort level about it. And then also beliefs regarding suicide. You know, for some, suicide, um, you know, is not is not okay. They view it as a sin. Or for others, they view that, um, you know, in an honorable way or um, as a way that they feel comfortable with and it feels like um, they are comfortable with the idea of suicide. So there could be very varying beliefs about death, dying, and suicide that this person that is experiencing those thoughts um, might also have. Um, and then just seeing that comfort level with disclosing personal information, um, you know, um, you know, talking about mental health and suicide can certainly feel uncomfortable sometimes. Um, so there might be varying levels of information that they feel comfortable sharing, and um, you might want to know more of how best to help them, but they might not feel very comfortable sharing all of that. Um, so there's some considerations of just kind of what someone might be bringing to the table of their own, you know, comfort and, and beliefs around, you know, death and dying and suicide. Um, so just, you know, be considering for, for yourselves, like any initial thoughts about asking the question, if you've, if you've had this experience before of having to ask someone if they're having thoughts of suicide or, or wanting to die by suicide, um, any initial thoughts that you have, concerns, you know, um, I know if you've never encountered someone in crisis, it can certainly maybe feel overwhelming. So if there's any, any questions or concerns that hopefully we can address um, at, at the end. All right, so we are on to the B of validating this person's experience, um, in, which includes, you know, talking openly about suicide, um, being willing to listen and allow the person to express their feelings. Um, it can be sometimes really hard because you want to, um, you know, share reasons why they don't want to kill themselves, but really, really being um, allowing them to talk and, and share their feelings, share their experiences, what they're going through. Um, and then, you know, reassuring that help is available. There are options for them, and, and that, that's where we get to the expediting um, and getting them treatment. But reassuring that, you know, help is available. You're there to listen and support, and additional help is also available for them. Um, so some, you know, some validating um, examples. So someone shares, you know, everything is so hard right now. I don't feel like being here anymore. Um, so that might be, you know, a little vague. It might go back to our, our earlier earlier example of, um, you know, someone is just saying something to get attention. Like, I don't feel like being here anymore. Um, but, you know, taking that seriously and, you know, some examples of I've had a response to that, you know, this would be a lot for anyone to handle. Um, you've been struggling with a lot. Others in your situation would or may also feel that way. Um, so really just validating that um, maybe they're not alone in feeling that way and um, it, it, it makes sense why they're feeling that way. Um, so some things to consider, you know, remaining as, as calm, calm as you can. Um, again, internally you might be feeling anxious or or, um, you know, concerned about this person, but, you know, remaining as calm, calm as you can um, and then listening more than you speak um, and maintaining that eye contact, really, you know, having that connection, using open body language, using that supportive or encouraging comments, um, which brings us to, you know, don't, don't argue. It, it's like it's also very instinctive. We want to argue against all the reasons you shouldn't be feeling that way or all the reasons that you might have to live or why would you want to do that? You know, I care about you so much. You know, we really want to try to solve the problem and make them feel better. Um, but that's not allowing them to kind of 
express how they're feeling and, and giving them the space to really, um, you know, uh, try to get that support of, of how they're feeling. Um, so trying not to argue against um, um, their thoughts of suicide. All right, so what do you do if you think someone's at risk for suicide? Um, <laughs> you know, not keeping the individual suicide behavior a secret if they've disclosed that they've attempted suicide or they've been, um, you know, self-harming in, in other ways. If this person is in crisis while you're speaking to them, you know, not leaving them alone. Um, you know, don't don't let them, you know, obviously people have free will, they can leave, but trying to, you know, keep them there with you, not leaving the room, um, trying to stay with them until they can get the help that they might be needing in, in that moment. Um, again, if it's a, if it's a crisis, um, you know, getting them that immediately help, immediate help from their doctor, nearest emergency room, 911 is always an option, or, um, you know, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Veterans Crisis Line at 980. Um, those are great ways you can call with the person that's in crisis, kind of do a handoff to the crisis line, and, and they can, you know, provide that further support. And then if they're still needing, um, um, you know, maybe additional resources, the Veterans Crisis Line can help, help coordinate that. Um, if the person, you know, doesn't need that immediate intervention and needing to get to a hospital or calling the crisis line, but they're needing, you know, further support, maybe further assessment, um, you know, if possible, being familiar with what resources are in your community, um, what health care, what mental health resources are there, what resources might be available in your faith-based communities if someone is preferring that. Um, you know, sometimes people don't feel comfortable seeking out mental health care at the VA or in the community, um, you know, and they don't want to see a mental health provider at that time and maybe prefer speaking with a faith community leader or maybe a traditional healer. So really also, as best you can, kind of um, getting the individual to the help that feels like it's the best fit and something that they will want to and feel comfortable accessing. Okay, so um, we have gone through the steps of stage and um, we can do all these things. We can provide great suicide prevention. We can intervene with individuals, get them the help, provide that support, um, you know, do some of these interventions like legal mean safety, you know, calling the crisis line if needed. We can do all these wonderful things and all these interventions. And unfortunately, suicide um, is still um, sometimes the, the outcome and that impacts um, individuals and communities. So I wanted to spend some time talking about suicide postvention. And if you, um, you have lost someone to suicide, maybe the impact of that, because um, it is important work and we are, um, you know, view suicide postvention as also a really important part of suicide prevention, just because like I said earlier is how exposure to suicide or knowing someone who's died by suicide also puts you at risk as an individual. So suicide postvention is just as important as the prevention work that we all do. Um, if suicide postvention is a new term, I just wanted to get us all on the same page of, of what that is. Um, so if there's a loss to suicide, um, postvention provides um, these services that are organized, immediate, and ongoing support following a suicide loss. So if you've ever experienced, it might be a suicide loss, it might be, um, you know, another, you know, loss type of loss, it might be um, any sort of crisis or, you know, typically there's a lot of support up front. You get a lot of um, outreach, you get a lot of support, maybe some meals, and typically as time passes, that, that that kind of decreases over time. So with suicide postvention, we really highlight the ongoing support over a period of time and not just immediately following that loss. With the intent to promote healing and, and reduce that suicide risk for those impacted. And like I said, it's really an important part of suicide prevention efforts. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about how complex suicide is. Um, and, you know, many of us are suicide loss survivors. Anyone you know may have um, died, anyone you encounter may know someone who died by suicide. Um, 
this one life lost to suicide, 135 others are exposed. That was a very jarring statistic so when I saw that. You know, you think of someone dying and maybe their immediate family, friends, maybe some coworkers might be impacted. But it really spreads out further than that and, and, and impacts people in communities, um, other people you've interacted with, um, you know, over time. You know, there's a whole list here of people who might, might be impacted. Um, and, you know, suicide is, you know, really complex and we might not have access to um, someone's full story or their full experience. And we might not completely know why someone chose to die by suicide and that also feels very uncomfortable and unsettling sometimes. We want the full story and we want to understand as humans and um, sometimes we might, we might not know um, why that decision was made. Um, you know, suicide loss is different than other kinds of losses. Um, you might face more stigma or blame. There might be post-trauma symptoms, guilt, confusion, maybe feelings around shame or anger. Um, a, lot, a lot can feel different around suicide loss and other types of losses. I'm not going to read all of these, um, but you will have access to them of, you know, just some common reactions you might experience following a suicide loss emotional ones, physical ones, cognitive, behavioral, existential, spiritual um, reactions. So um, some of these might be present, all of them might be present, they might change day to day. Um, it really is, it's so, it's so dependent on kind of how your experience, individuals, how they experience uh, reactions to suicide. But what is important is recognizing your reactions and acknowledging and accepting what those feelings are no matter what they are without judgment. Um, there's no right way to feel. Um, you might be shocked, like I'm feeling angry and I wasn't expecting that. Or one day maybe you're feeling very um, relieved and you might not have expected that either. So really accepting whatever feelings you're having without judgment. And then not trying to take other people's stress reactions personally. So their reactions just might be very different from your own. Everyone processes grief differently um, and um, on their own time as, as well. Um, so I know I'm getting close to my, my time, I think. So um, I want to, I don't want to rush through these, but I do want to make sure we get, get to the resources as well. Um, but after loss of suicide, you know, those thoughts you might be having about it, feelings, needs, can and do change over time. So what you're needing immediately might feel very different than what you're needing maybe a year, a year later. Um, things you can do on your own that, that might help, um, talking about your reactions, memorializing or honoring the person who died in some way um, that feels feels appropriate and, and genuine to you. Um, creating a narrative that allows for the complexity that grief presents, uncertainty, and, and compassion for yourself. Connecting with other lost survivors or families, friends um, can be really, really important. And then, you know, mental health professionals can also offer that support um, by helping you kind of navigate those feelings in a non-judgmental way. Um, you know, kind of working with you about maybe unhelpful beliefs or negative thoughts that you might be having and alleviate that pain. Um, and then helping identify ways that you can maybe become more connected with others, um, other lost survivors potentially. You know, some spiritual religious self-care, um, you know, reaching out to um, spiritual support group or faith community leader, that community is so essential to a healing process. Um, Continuing your practice, um, maybe it will lead to develop a new faith practices and rituals. Um, you know, discussing any spiritual grief issues that you might be having, those ex existential or spiritual uh, reactions to suicide that were on that previous slide. Um, you know, a lot of the ones that can always can have the potential leading to complicated grief. Um, and then, you know, showing that that grace to yourself and others and um, that, that can feel very hard sometimes, but as much as you can of that, that self-compassion and, and validation of, of how you're, how you're feeling. Um, you know, so kind of like with SAVE of, you know, how to support someone in crisis, there's also similar, similar elements of supporting a suicide loss survivor, you know, listening to them, you know, having these tough conversations, offering full attention, you know, validating how they're feeling and, Resist is better to fix or reframe or advise, um, you know, validating that there's no timeline and everyone experiences this differently. Um, so very similar, um, you know, listening, that validation, supporting, um, you know, kind of what, what can you do? Can I help with a tangible task? I'm going to go get your groceries for you today. 
can I take your dog for a walk? Um, you know, anniversaries or, you know, things like um, birthdays or holidays can be very challenging times. So reaching out during this time. Um, and then uh, honoring. So, you know, reaching out, using that person's name. You know, I'm so sorry to hear, you know, X died. You know, not trying to dance around who, who that person is. You know, really acknowledging that that person died and using their name. Um, how are you going to honor them? Maybe, you know, a memorial walk or um, lighting a candle, you know, whatever feels feels um, in line with how you would like to honor honor that person. Um, so some final thoughts, uh, you know, that healing healing takes time, you know, allowing yourself the time you need to grieve. Don't put a timeline on it, like in six months I'll feel this way. Um, you know, really just allowing yourself um, the time that you need and allowing kind of the ups and downs and different, different emotions to come and accepting those. Um, there's, um, you know, elements of commonality in how people experience grief, but, you know, each person's, um, each situation is very unique. Um, you know, and setbacks or painful reminders can sometimes catch you off guard. You might see something and that reminds you of that person and, and you weren't expecting that and it kind of sends you into, you know, feeling sad or depressed. Um, but, you know, it's normal and expected, expected part of the grieving and healing process. All right. I made it just on time for the resources. Um, so uh, there is a video save training. Um, this it's you know it's online just like Armor. It's 25 minutes. Um, it's available whenever you want. So if you want a refresher, uh, if you want someone else kind of describing the steps of save. It's a, it's a wonderful training and available you know whenever you, you would like to take it. Uh, you know got the crisis line um, information here. It's, it's uh, several places in the training. Um, and some additional resources for faith communities, you know, the Action Alliance and Suicide Prevention Resource Center have, have some wonderful resources available. And um, as Ms. Pauling said at the beginning, a part of our Suicide Risk Management Consultation Program. So if you are an individual or provider working at veterans at risk for suicide and you would like some consultation, um, we do it in a de-identified way. We don't, you know, know who this person is you're consulting on. You kind of provide generals about who they are and, you know, can talk about lethal mean safety counseling, um, you know, how to engage that, that veteran who might be at risk for suicide. And then we also do offer postvention support as well in consultation. Lots of lists, uh, a long list of uh, suicide loss survivor resources. I always like to highlight TAPS. Um, so uh, that is available for, um, you know, anyone, uh, for veterans who have died by suicide for their family members, other people impacted by that loss. Our Uniting for Suicide Postvention website has a ton of resources, videos, infographics, um, you know, podcasts for different settings, your community, providers, and, and workplace. And that leads us to our Q&A. Um, so I am so appreciative of you all being here today and I'm happy to Ask, answer any questions or, or further elaborate on anything that we um, talked about today. Thank you, Ms. Jarrett, for that very uh, informative presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. I do not see uh, any questions in the Q&A box. There is one that uh, is directed toward our office. They want Mrs. Lori Grabber would like to know how often we have the SAVE training, monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual. We have a monthly SAVE training every month. If you go to our website, www.va.gov slash CFBMP, which will be at the end of this uh, on our point of contact information, you can go to our website and see previous SAVE training and upcoming SAVE training. We have one standard training every month um, and um, and you can go to see it there anytime you want previous training or upcoming training. So that is all um, I have for you right now. Uh, did you want to add anything else, Mrs. Uh, Gerard, before I, we close out this meeting? Um, yes, I would just like to um, 
reiterate that um, our consultation program is available for people in providers in VA and outside of the VA. So um, you do not have to be a VA employee to access our consultation program. Um, you would just send us an email and you know, we will take it from there and get you set up with um, you know, the, the consultation that you're needing. So you do not have to be a VA employee to access our consultation program. Also, thank you so much again, Ms. Gerard. Also, you can see our team point of contact information on the screen. Please reach out to us if you have any question. We have a website, an email address, and Facebook page there as well. If you have any more questions um, for Ms. Gerard, please, you can forward them directly to us, forward them to our office, and we'll forward them to her, and she will get right back with you. If you registered for this event, we will provide you with today's presentation. Please subscribe to our website and Facebook for future webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today. This adjourns today's webinar. Thank you and have a safe and wonderful day. Goodbye.